That was a sudden ending. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I sing the mighty power of God indeed, and so we do that this morning as we gather for worship. Welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ. Welcome to you who are present in the sanctuary and you who are present online. We are so glad that you are here. If you are new here today, we encourage you, if you have any questions, just, you know, gently elbow the person next to you and, and uh, they will help you find the answer. If you're uh, joining with us online, we hope that you'll type a note in the chat and let us know that you're here and how you're doing. And if you are here in the sanctuary, look for the little blue folder uh, that should be somewhere in your pew, sign it, pass it down, that helps us know who's here and if there's anything that you need. I'm, I'm Pastor Rachel. Uh, today our liturgist is Andrew and we uh, are delighted to share this service of worship with you. This is Reformation Sunday. I know y'all thought it was Halloween. And it is tomorrow and also has been for the last week but um yes but it's also reformation sunday and so whether you identify as a traditionalist or a reformer or a traditionally reformed or you have no idea what i'm talking about no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey you are welcome here uh, we have a couple of announcements about the life of the church. I'm going to invite Cindy forward to talk about uh, next week's big adventures. And while she's coming up, I want to say thank you. We had an amazing week last week. We had the Oktoberfest with the trunk or treat and church potluck. We had adult education. We had choir. 
so much stuff. And it's all because you each are pitching in and offering what you can, and it is beautiful, and it feels like church is moving again, and we are so grateful. So thank you. Hello, I'm Cindy, and I'm part of the mission team. Um, real quick, if you're new, Mission Fest. We pick a couple projects. We stay after worship next Sunday, and you pick the project you want to work on. Spend about three hours on it. It's a way for us as a whole church to um, service the community. So a few things we're going to do is um, we're going to tie blankets again. If you don't know how to tie blankets, don't worry. There are plenty of people that do, and including kids. Everybody knows how to tie a blanket. Good place to learn. Um, we're going to Eastern Cemetery. We're going to place flags on veterans' graves, so that's pretty cool, too. Um, Brooklawn, we're going to Brooklawn Campus and kind of refresh, refurbish some centerpieces so the staff don't have to do that. Um, and they will be used for the um, Thanksgiving dinner that's coming up. They haven't had that in two years, so I'm sure these things got stuck in a box and are smashed and smushed and just look ugly. So we're gonna pretty those things up for them. If that's your thing, work on campus. Um, da, 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 what's my fourth? Oh, we're gonna work here. Out in the yard, weather permitting, we have some uh, rails, handrails that need to be sanded and painted, and that's, that's according to the weather. We have some plants that need to be cut back and we have leaves that need to be picked up. So it's next week, right after worship, bring your own sack lunch. Um, we're gonna do that and then we'll head out and serve. So if you haven't signed up, there's sign up sheets back there. Um, but if you change your mind, you can, you know, do whatever you want next Sunday. We're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. If you haven't been to Mission Fest, this is one of the best opportunities to get to know your people here at Emmanuel and also help out folks at the same time. We have uh, two opportunities for adult education. I want to make sure you have noticed in your bulletin after church today, it is Reformation Sunday. So we're going to do a quick and dirty history of the church from the beginning of Jesus's preaching to the Reformation um, in 10 minutes. You can time it. And uh, but then we'll also talk about uh, some of the the themes of the Reformation and how they might impact who we are now as a church. Uh, and that is also a bring your own lunch, but we have lots of bagels and cream cheese if you need fed. So uh, we hope that you'll join us uh, for that. We're going to meet in the conference room unless we are overwhelmed, um, and then we will move down to the dining room. And this Wednesday is our final reproductive justice uh, adult education. This one is focused on learning what exactly Amendment 2 says and what impacts that might have on uh, women's health and uh, reproductive justice. So. Um, if you're interested in that, please come at six o'clock. We promise to be out in time for choir. And finally, there is one more ONA uh, that's open and affirming for LGBTQ plus people. Um, there's one more in-person uh, interest meeting that will be at the house of the Bucalos family. And there's a sign up for that in the narthex. Uh, and you can also email the church office um, to sign up for that too or call. And I said finally, but I didn't really mean it because today is also Pledge Sunday. Um, so if you don't have one of these fancy little cards, um, we have them available for you. I am sure that uh, I see Billy's already moving. If you, if you want one of these cards, this is a pledge card. If you are a member of Emmanuel, we really hope you'll fill it out. If you're not a member, you can still fill it out. This helps us know what you think you might be able to give for the next year. Um, and we will collect those at the offering and uh, we will bless them. And so we hope that you uh, can turn in your pledge card today. I think we're ready for a call to worship. Um, I made a mistake and uh, told Heather to print the call to worship in the spot where the confession is. So look ahead to where it says confession 
And that's the call to worship. And I invite you to rise in body and spirit and join us in that. Once upon a time, a wise man offered a challenge. What is the greatest commandment? The calendars on our desks share a vision of greatness, bills to pay, phone calls to return, appointments to keep. Love the Lord your God. The cameras of our memories share what commands us, children to bathe and partners to help, parents calling and grandchildren hopeful. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Still, the spirit lures us into new priorities, open spaces to experience wonder, strangers becoming friends, devotion to what that which transcends. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let us worship with our opening hymn. the time when we would typically do our children's moment. However, pretty much all of our children are sick today. <laughs> so we're going to send prayers uh, to them and, um, uh, and to the ones who are active in other ways as well. Uh, and we will move ahead to our confession, which I have invited Andrew to help me do. In this church, confession is a time when we let go of the things that might keep us from being able to fully embrace and live in the joy that is God's grace. And so we are reflecting today on the story of the Good Samaritan. And here is a confession based on that story. Would you pass a hurt man by? Jesus asks. Never. No, we wouldn't pass him by. But we're no fools. We just want to be sure. Sure that we're safe. Sure that's what that's where wearing clothes that can get dirty. Sure that we're not running late. Sure that they'll use our own money only in ways we approve of. Sure that they deserve our help and will be grateful for it. Let us pray. God. Right now, we're the kind of people 
who will help under the right circumstances. Help us become the right people to help under any circumstances. Amen. Friends, Jesus assures us that the one who is a neighbor is the one who offers mercy. And to really show us, Jesus offers that mercy to each of us over and over. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you please join me in the statement of faith in the back of your hymnal? We believe in God, the eternal spirit, who is made known to us in Jesus, our brother, and to whose deeds we testify. God calls the worlds into being, creates humankind in the divine image, and sets before us the ways of life and death. God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. God judges all humanity and all nations by that will of righteousness declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, God has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the whole creation to its creator. God bestows upon us the Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. God promises to all who trust in the gospel, forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in that kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto God. Amen. for the choir because now they are going to share with us this beautiful anthem.
The scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, choir. Friends, let us pray. God, we hear your word and it challenges us. Help us be open to what you might be doing in our hearts today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this parable is a classic Jesus move. Oh, you wanna challenge me on a debate of ideas? Why don't I tell you this cryptic story instead and make you think about it for the rest of your life? We really like to do that with parables. They, they told these stories that weren't 100% clear, but did make you think. And Luke, who is the one who records this particular story, was not a huge fan of biblical scholars, um, especially lawyers. I noticed the Fantonis are not here today. So, you know, oh, there they are. Oh, they were just sitting at a different spot. Never mind. <laughs> well, not you. I was going to say not you, but these were religious lawyers, um, not lawyers who practice religion. Anyway. I'm just digging my hole deeper, aren't I? Um, anyway, Luke, not a fan of lawyers. And the way he presented them in particular, um, he thought that they read things a little bit too literally, like trying to find every way they could to find a loophole. Sometimes they did read with with truth, truly faithful intent, and sometimes they were trying to figure out the bare minimum of where to draw the boundaries. Sometimes it was both. Jesus tended to think that they were a little too into boundaries, though, especially the Jesus that Luke characterized. Matthew's was a little kinder to the profession, so the lawyers among you might prefer Matthew. But this parable sets up a scenario that will challenge any legalistic mindset. 
And perhaps because we are part of a denomination and a branch of Christianity that originated in Western Europe and tends to take the, let's say, dominant power position in most cases, we tend to look at this story in a particular way. And if you want to know more about how that happened, come to our class after church. The Euro-American churches and those influenced by them tend to look at this story and imagine themselves as the Good Samaritan. We like to see ourselves as both revolutionaries for, and righteous. We're the freedom fighters, we're the good guys, or at least we're the ones trying to be the good guys. Especially when there's a contrast of those who are perceived to be righteous, like the priest and the Levite, which was kind of like a second tier priest, as opposed to the Samaritan, who we often think of as the outsider, the one who was not welcome in Jewish areas, which is not entirely true, but it's somewhat accurate. And we like to name things after this character of the Good Samaritan. There's a hospital in Lexington called Good Samaritan. There are Good Samaritan laws that protect those who try to help others. And we even have a fund at the church to help people out of binds called the Good Samaritan Fund. I think we mostly try to be that good one. So that's obviously with whom we identify in the story. And that is greatly a factor of our reformed heritage. But first century Jews, not so much. They might first have identified with the guy in the ditch instead of the Samaritan, because they would never identify with a Samaritan. Samaritans were absolutely enemies. Think of how people in the United States felt about members of Al Qaeda in 2001. Going back centuries, they were uncomfortable neighbors. They each scorned each other for their way of worship and fought over geopolitical battles for territory. To get a good idea of what's going on, the chapter right before this has Jesus and his little band of Mary disciples going through Samaria and being completely rejected for hospitality, which was a huge no-no in the Middle Eastern culture at the time. It was a huge insult. And Jesus' disciples are furious, and they're asking Jesus if they should call on God to destroy them. Now Jesus calms them down a little bit. He rebukes them for their fury. And then he makes it worse because he tells this parable. A few verses later, he chooses the Samaritan as the one who is the exemplar of God's law. Technically, the Hebrew term for, in the Torah for neighbor was anyone with whom you shared a border, whether you liked them or not. And because sharing a border is so hard, there were lots of rules and advisories about it. And Jesus in this story is reminding both the lawyer and his disciples that they do share a border with the Samaritans and that the Samaritans are people too. This isn't just a story about being nice, about going the extra mile in order to help someone in need, which is very good, and I think Jesus would be very proud of us for doing that. But Jesus is also challenging his followers, humbling them, humbling us, by insisting on learning from someone they consider to be an enemy. Now, some of us like to pretend that we don't have enemies. And, you know, we may not even really think that we do. But Jesus knows that everybody has got some kind of enemy one way or another. Some enemies we choose, some choose us. I could imagine him sort of preaching in the style of Jeff Foxworthy saying, if you purposely choose to position yourself far away from a certain aunt or uncle at the Thanksgiving table, you might have an enemy. If you instinctively hold tighter to your purse or wallet when a person of a different race walks by, you might have an enemy. If your cell phone rings and your finger automatically swipes reject call, you might 
have an enemy. If you have to stop yourself from running your car over someone's ridiculous yard sign, especially in this season, you might have an enemy. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I kind of identify with a few of those. We usually develop enemies for good reason. We fear the harm that they might do to us. Sometimes they really have done us harm. The Samaritans surely did. But we turn them into stereotypes, and in so doing, we forget that they are also human. We forget also that we have had some part to play in that enmity, that maybe we weren't always the good one. And when we do that, we become the enemy too. This happens all the time. It happens a lot on the worldwide scale. You may remember the war on terror that was designed to fight back for 9-11 and ended up decimating several nations, many of whom did not have much to do with 9-11. And on a personal level, consider the ways in which we have siloed ourselves from political and religious views unlike our own. Are we afraid that we could be proven wrong or that our position can't hold up to scrutiny or that we might be tainted somehow by associating with that person or that we just can't control the anger that we feel for the hurt that we perceive. One way into this parable is to reflect on who our enemies are, even if we wouldn't normally use that word. Whom do we distrust, dismiss, condemn, or scorn? Who regards us with disdain, even if we don't feel the same about them? What happens if we are to imagine that we are in the ditch and they are the ones to reach out? It can force our stereotypes to crumble. It can force us to realize that we might have things in common with that person, and at the very least, a common humanity, a common understanding of suffering. It opens a little crack of love. I recently had this happen to me. I was uh, scrolling through Facebook, as I do, uh, and there's this guy from my high school who always post things that just make my blood boil. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it really, it, it's so hard. And I have not unfriended him because I'm really trying hard not to unfriend people just because they post things I don't like. But some of these things make me assume that if we were in the same room together, he would either not talk to me or somehow attack me. But he saw my post about doing the Alzheimer's walk with my mother-in-law, and he messaged me. And it turns out we do have some life experiences in common. And he knew the ravages of this disease, too. It forced me to stop thinking bad things about him when I saw his name come up in my feed. It forced me to think of him as a neighbor even a friend who was reaching out to me as I lay in a sort of ditch. How might thinking this way help our congregation as we seek to embody grace in action? Can we envision ourselves not just as the good guys, the ones who are fully inclusive of all people, the ones who would always cross the road to help, which I hope we would, but also remember those times when the bad guys helped us, when those whom we have, may have felt betrayed us were also our neighbors, when we maybe didn't cross the road and now regret it. And if we do want to identify with a Samaritan, how can we acknowledge the ways that we have been part of harm? How can we begin to repent of it and reach out to those who are hurting now? I think we as Emmanuel are trying to do that with our initiatives to become open and affirming for LGBTQ plus people, 
becoming wise for mental health, be trying to become more accessible to people with varying disabilities. We are trying to open our doors more fully to our neighbors, even when sometimes it's not comfortable. And these are ways of reaching out to those who have not exactly been enemies, but with whom we've shared uneasy borders. And seeing it makes me overjoyed to be your pastor. I feel so lucky to be part of a congregation that is not so full of itself that it can't recognize its missteps. A congregation that is not so prominent that it forgets its humble roots. A congregation willing to try new things in order to love more people. The character of the Good Samaritan is an excellent distillation of what the church should be. He provides medical care and shelter and food and money and presence and aid, all without worry of being repaid. So it is, of course, Stewardship Sunday, Pledge Day. And it is also Reformation Sunday, a reminder that we are reformed and always reforming. And it is my hope that you will feel as passionate about being a part of this community of folks in the ditch as I am. As Oscar Wilde famously wrote in one of his plays, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And I'm grateful to be looking at the stars with you all. And I hope that you will invest in that future too with your treasure, your time and your talent. We need all of those things. And we need all of you and we need all of our neighbors. Together, helping each other, we have a shot at embodying God's grace in action. To tell you more, I'm gonna invite Rich Ackerman forward. Hi everyone. Or I should say aloha with the shirt I have on today. God is good. God is great. And today's the day we put our pledge cards in the plate. <laughs> so, so I'm here today to talk about Stewardship Sunday and our pledge cards. Um, does everybody, did everybody have one? I do want to thank those who've already uh, sent theirs in and put theirs in their plate. Uh, if anybody would like one, uh, uh, Billy uh, or I will be happy to pass one out. But these cards do help the finance committee and the uh, council decide on how to plan the budget. And once we do collect all the cards, we will be, uh, well, the finance committee will be able to fill out all these blank spots on our budget for 2023. So uh, this really does help plan our next year's budget. With that being said, uh, we would like to uh, have our offering today. And I know, Andrew, uh, it's uh, going to be a little different. Uh, uh, I know that uh, what a birthday, uh, early birthday present you've got uh, by being liturgist today. It's uh, almost as good as uh, uh, your uncle having to be, uh, how should I say it? That uh, it's almost as good as a present as your aunt being married to your uncle for 29 years. Uh, <laughs> happy anniversary. <laughs> happy birthday to Cheryl, too. Uh, happy anniversary to Rev and Darlene. Uh, who, was there any other birthdays on there? Or anniversaries? Or, yeah, but it's a good day to celebrate a lot of things today. Uh, but uh, Andrew, did you have an a offertory prayer? So maybe if we could uh, ask the ushers to come down uh, and you do your offertory prayer. And when the ushers come around, you, if you haven't put your offerings in or your pledge cards in, in the plate, uh, we can do it at this time, okay? So should we have the yeah. ushers come forward? Can the ushers please come forward? It's been a long time since we did this. <laughs> In our giving to you this day, 
We bl- may you bless us so that we might better keep our eyes focused on you. So many cards, so many electronic commitments, so many promises about what we will do and spend and achieve together. Bless these high hopes, God. Bless these pledges and turn them into homes and healing and reconciliation and celebration, bridges and salvation and a whole new world. Make us like you people who keep their promises and put them into action. Thanks be to God. Amen. One of our modern day reformers, Marin Tiribasi, wrote this this week, what I would nail on a church door or nine theses, which is plenty for our current attention span. Number one, open me. Number two, open me wider. Number three, open me to people you don't agree with, people you are afraid of, the children of God with fur, fins and feathers and also scales. Land under your feet, water with waves, with bridges, with the music of small stones in drops on your face, unrepeatable cold crystal beauty, also wind. That's right, skip the spiritual weather ceiling. Four, celebrate all the free indulgences that heal. Avoid the ones that cost too much. To you also see list in thesis number three. Five, you can't buy heaven. That includes payments of money, prayer, study, and activism, and pledges. Forgive others, forgive yourself. Six, 
opened doors to other sanctuaries, mosque, pagoda, synagogue, shrine, temple, altar, storefront, masjid, learn. Seven, opened doors to other sanctuaries, wildlife refuge, farm sanctuary, bird sanctuary, nature conservancy, companion animal shelter, learn. Eight, open me without an agenda, pray, learn, love, love more. Nine, open me. Open us, God, to all the neighbors that we are called to help. Open us to all that might be a help to us. Today, we also ask your strength and nourishment for the journey upon those in our heart, for Lydia and Jennifer and Betty's loved ones and Jane and George and Gail and Tina and all who suffer from COVID and other illnesses and our beloveds who are homebound or in nursing and senior facilities, Mary Lou, Mary Ellen, Doris, May, Gail, and people everywhere affected by violence, disasters, oppression, and war, and those whom we hold close in our hearts. All of these we lift to you as we pray as Jesus taught us, reaching out to you as our Redeemer, our Sustainer, and our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, before we close, there's one announcement I forgot to make, which is that there's a collection box out there for Miram as well. They are in a bit of a pinch with an insurance bill. Um, and if you are able to help with that, they would be very grateful. Miram is the place where we send our youth to camp um every summer and it is a place deeply beloved to many who are here you can't be god thanks be to god but you can ask god to work through you you can't know all that god knows but you can ask god to give you a glimpse you can't do what god can do but you can ask god to help you do more than you can do alone and you may not be the one who makes the grace but you can help put it into action. May the blessing of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer be with you as you do. Amen. Amen.